The way we lead impacts the way people live. This world needs truly human leadership. I'm Brent Stewart, your host. Thanks for listening. This podcast is an outreach of Barry Waymiller. You can connect with us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter at Barry Waymiller and find our podcasts, articles, and videos at trulyhumanleadership.com. You're listening to a Truly Human Leadership podcast refresher where we reshare insight from podcast episodes from the past. On this THL refresher, We'd like to bring you a couple interviews with our friend, author and renowned peace negotiator, Bill Urey. The first is an interview that myself and Mary Rudder, our director of communications, did with Bill. And then the second is a special conversation with Bill and our CEO, Bob Chapman. Bill Urey is the author of such best-selling books as Getting DS, Getting DS with Yourself, The Power of a Positive No, and Getting Past No. But for the past 35 years, Bill has served as a negotiation advisor and mediator in conflicts ranging from the Kentucky Wildcat coal mine strikes to ethnic wars in the Middle East, the Balkans, and the former Soviet Union. He has taught negotiation and mediation to tens of thousands of corporate executives, labor leaders, diplomats, and military officers all over the globe. With former President Jimmy Carter, Bill co-founded the International Negotiation Network, a non-governmental body seeking to end civil wars around the world. In an advisory capacity, he helped end a civil war in Indonesia and assisted in preventing one in Venezuela. You'll actually hear more of that story in a little bit. Bill has long been a friend of Barry Waymiller. He and our CEO, Bob Chapman, both feel very strongly that listening is one of the keys to good leadership. They believe listening is the most important thing we as humans can do for one another. It shows empathy, it shows you care, and most importantly, it shows the person you're listening to that they matter. So here's a conversation our global messaging leader, Mary Rudder, and I had with Bill about listening, conflict, the power of a positive no, and getting to yes. In negotiation, I think of listening as the cheapest concession you can possibly make because it costs you almost nothing and it means everything to the other side. So if you want something that costs you little and delivers a lot of value to the other side, opens the door, opens their ears, makes them more willing to listen to you, then there's no better step, first step, than than to listen to them. We think of communication as talking, but actually it's just as much, if not more, about listening, which is the invisible part of communication, that actually if you observe the behavior, if I observe the behavior of successful negotiators, be they in the workplace or in diplomacy or wherever, they listen far more than they talk. That listening turns out to be the key skill that we all need to learn. And uh, we need to listen even more than we talk. I remember actually once when uh, Bob uh, Chapman took me to visit some of the Barry Waymiller plants. And there was uh, one plant, I think it was way up in in northern uh, Wisconsin. And we were walking the floor and just talking to people who were working these giant machines, uh, you know, what difference had it made since Barry Waymiller had, you know, had bought the, the plant. And one fellow took off his earmuffs, his, you know, his work earmuffs there, whatever, and thought about the question for a moment. He says, well, I'll tell you the difference. They listen to you. <laughs> that was the difference. Uh, and what he meant by that was that, you know, every morning, you know, there's there was a there was this uh, council, this circle, or whatever, where you know the the supervisor would invite everyone to talk about what's working, what's not working, and it wasn't, and and then follow up on that, and that's you know that 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 was kind of key. But it's not just both that gives a kind of substantive improvement to obviously the processes of work, but I think what underlying it is. Listening is the basic way that we communicate respect for other human beings, that we say, I see you, I hear you. And before he felt that, you know, they were pretty much not listened to. They were kind of not treated with the respect that every human being deserves. And what I've found is that 
whatever the issue is, whether I'm negotiating in Colombia, you know, with uh, the guerrillas or, 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 or dealing with a, a business dispute, that the basic fundamental first step is to respect and the best way to do that is to really listen to the person. And in this day and age, it's not always so easy because there's so much coming at us, emails and texts and so much all the time that we forget that most elementary less lesson, which is to listen. And as you mentioned, it's not listening isn't as easy as it sometimes seems to be. I mean, it's 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 not just hearing the other person. It's you know, it's not just sometimes when we say we listen okay, that means you're sort of taking in what the other side is saying, their words. But listening, true listening means listening from what's behind the words. Where's the person really coming from? What are they really concerned about? Uh, and listening for what's not in the words. And it's also about not just listening from, as we do, from our frame of reference, which is, you know, we listen, but we're, you know, there's an inner voice saying, I disagree with that, I disagree with that. And you're just kind of listening in order to be able to rebut or refute what the other person is saying. True listening is when you put yourself in the other person's shoes, you listen from within their frame of reference. How does it actually feel to be in their shoes? And that's where you can get the true breakthroughs. Yeah, yeah. I think it's interesting, though, now that it's almost like you have we have to change the word listening if you think about it, because so much of communication now happens without the use of our ears. You know, my children that are teenagers, they spend their time texting and that's how they, you know, communicate. And they rarely I mean, they it's foreign to them to actually make a phone call. And so I. Um, I'm wondering if your work has had to change based upon the way we have come to communicate these days. That's a really, really good point, Mary. Uh, you know, as an anthropologist, you know, just reflecting, I mean, we evolved for 99% more than that of our history as creatures who took an in information uh, like that through our ears. You know, we're oral cultures. Uh, and writing is on, is a recent innovation and uh, so w we we listen differently with our ears than we do with our eyes and so you're right that you know a heavy reliance on uh, you know reading texts and so on it, it it brings in different faculties although one thing I'm interesting I, I've started to use whatsapp a lot and uh, and whatsapp it allows you not just to, to text messages but to text short, uh, uh, spoken messages, and it's so. So there's a funny way in which uh, the spoken word is coming back e even into that short kind of uh, those, those short uh, back and forth. And the truth is that we're we're learning. We're in a we're in a moment of huge experimentation with communication around social media that, uh, and which everything is going to have to adapt, including the way in which we negotiate and deal with our disputes and any daily issues or make deals. Tell us a story of one of your uh, most successful uh, endeavors to get people to yes. Well, uh, good question. Um, I could tell you a story just to kind of demonstrate that to me the the, the power of listening um, in a in a large context. Uh, about a number of years ago, a little over a decade. I was invited in by uh, President Carter and the United Nations into the country of Venezuela, which was polarized at that point uh, between people who supported the current president, president was President Hugo Chavez, and people who opposed him. And uh, and I was asked to kind of meet with him or meet with with the opposition. And so I, at one point, I I, I had a number of meetings with the president. Um, and one of the meetings uh, was, I remember, was set for, he liked to meet late at night at 9 p.m. in the presidential palace. And I waited there with my colleague Francisco and 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, midnight. And finally, we're ushered in to see the president. And I expected to find him alone. But in fact, he had his entire cabinet uh, arrayed behind him. He'd been having a late meeting. And he motioned me to a chair and he said, so, Bill, uh, what do you think of the situation here? What's your impression? 
how are things going? And I said, well, Mr. President, I've been talking to some of your ministers here and to some of the opposition leaders, and it seems to me there's a little bit of progress. Well, as soon as he heard the word progress there, he got triggered and he said, what do you mean progress? And he leaned in very close to my face and he said, are you naive? Uh, you're not seeing the dirty tricks those traitors on the other side are up to? And he leaned in very close to my face and proceeded to shout at me for, I would say, approximately 30 minutes. <laughs> and, you know, inside me, you know, I was thinking, I'm not naive. You know, you're, you know, you're going through this and I was feeling a little bit, you know, embarrassed in front of everyone that the president is shouting at me. But I'm all, above all, I'm thinking, well, here, here's a year and a half of hard work going down the drain here. And so, you know, your mind goes through all these places. But I was able to um, catch myself for a moment before I reacted, you know, and said what I wanted to say. And... Uh, I, it, it's a it's a, a process I call going to the balcony. It's almost like you're negotiating on a stage, and part of you, your mind goes to a mental and emotional balcony overlooking that stage. In other words, a place of perspective where you can keep your eyes on the prize. Mm -hmm. So I went to the balcony for a moment there and asked myself, you know, is it really going to advance this matter if I get into an argument with the president of Venezuela? I mean, what's my prize? My prize is helping to help bring some peace, restore some peace to the situation. So, so I just uh, decided to listen. And, uh, and having listened to myself, to my own kind of internal kind of voices, you know, I was able to calm them down. Then I listened to the president. And for about 30 minutes, I was just there nodding my head, listening to him. And, he was well known for making speeches for eight hours, um, but after 30 minutes of me not, you know, not kind of taking the bait and getting into an argument with him, which could have gone on for many hours, but simply listening to him, I was just watching his, his watching him carefully, just listening, trying to figure out what what's really disturbing him and so on, and truly listening to him. And, and at some point, I saw watching his body language, I saw his shoulders sink a little bit. And uh, he said to me in a weary tone of voice, so Yuri, what should I do? And that is the, you know, that's the, the faint sound of a human mind opening is when they turn around. If I had tried to, sometimes when someone else is angry and dealing with you, you know, if you try to, you just get angry back or, or you know, it's, it, you're not going to get through to them using reason because it's like, you know, hitting your your head against the wall. But that was when his mind was a little bit open. So I said to him, I think, Mr. President, um, I, if you'll permit me to make a suggestion here, it's December, Christmas is coming near. Uh, last Christmas, all the festivities around the country were canceled because of this conflict, this confrontation. It looks like the same thing's gonna happen this Christmas. Why not give everyone a chance, the whole country to go to, go to the balcony, as it were, give everyone a chance to, to enjoy their Christmas holidays with their families, uh, take a break and call a truce. And, uh, you know, in, in January, we can come back and resume the conversation. And he said to me, you know, that's a great idea. I'm going to propose that in my next speech. And his mood had entirely changed. Mm -hmm. He was now willing to listen to me because I had listened to him. Mm -hmm. And then he started to get all chummy. He said, "You know, and you know, now that I think about it, you ought to come, you ought to come travel the country with me over Christmas and see it better and get to know it better." And then he thought for a moment. And he said, "Oh, but uh, but you're a neutral. Maybe it wouldn't be so good for you to be seen in my company." And he said, "No worries about that. I'll give you a disguise." <laughs> <laughs> and 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 his mood had completely shifted. Now, how had that happened? Because of the power of not reacting, the power of going to the balcony, and above all, the power of listening. Hmm. Wow. Well, your reaction, what, if you had reacted negatively, it would have been a mirror of what he, you know, it was, would have been a mirror of what he was doing. And so, you know, you allowed him to see him for what he didn't want to be. Does That's that it. Sense? That's it. That's it. And, and uh, you know, he suddenly went from being my adversary to being my partner. And 
it was kind of a shift. And I think it's through a power that we all have, actually, that we can use with anyone around us if they, you know, are yelling at us or if we're having a difficult situation or a child or, you know, it's, um, it's, it's, there are these simple tools of, to me, of listening and listening allows you to put yourself in the shoes of the other. It's empathy. It's not necessarily sympathy, which is just, you know, feeling what the other person's feeling. Empathy means feeling into, uh, and it's kind of, so it's an, it's an ability to understand where the other side's coming from. And that, if you think about it in negotiation, what are you trying to do in negotiation? You're often trying to change someone else's mind. And the question is, if you're trying to change someone else's mind, how can you possibly do that unless you know where that mind is right now? And how can you do that without listening and putting yourself in their shoes? And that's why, to me, the cornerstone, the, the foundation stone of effective communication, effective negotiation, is the ability to put yourself in their shoes, which is really through the behavior of listening. Taking that from a macro level to a, a micro level, some statistics, in 25% of workers, avoiding conflict leads to sickness or absence from work. And 10% of workers say that workplace conflict leads to project failure. And more than one third say that conflict results in someone leaving the company. And 2.8, uh, we spend 2.8 hours per week dealing with conflict at work. And I think I kind of know what the answer is, but what are your thoughts on how there's this much conflict in our workplaces that people, everyday people deal with every day? Well, I mean, it's sad. I mean, it's a huge, a huge cost. And I think a lot of it, some of it may be necessary conflict, but much of it is unnecessary conflict or it's conflict that's badly dealt with. Because for me, the way I've come to understand it is conflict is not necessarily a bad thing. Conflict is like, uh, I mean, you know, life, life is, you know, is naturally full of conflict. The real question is, is not whether we have conflict or not. The real question is how we deal with the conflict. Do we deal with it constructively through listening and negotiation and problem solving and or do we deal with it destructively, as so often happens, through uh, you know through argue I mean through arguments and and fighting and threatening and and all kinds of destructive ways that destroy relationships and as you see destroy huge sums of time energy suffering ulcers people leaving the jobs the costs. Of destructive conflict are, are huge and so we have a huge uh, to me I, I see you know kind of courses in communication listening a focus on that as playing a hugely preventive role in maintaining the health of the organization and the other thing I'll say too is um, not all the the uh, the costs of conflict come from overt conflict but what often happens I see in the workplace is there's a huge amount of avoidance, which is, uh, you know, people aren't necessarily, you know, getting angry with each other in an overt way. But, un but what, what they're seething within and no one talks about it because no one wants to bring it up because they're afraid of what's going to happen. And by not talking about it, by not engaging with it constructively, uh, that can be as, as deadly and corrosive from within, even though there's no fireworks on the outside. The title of uh, your book that everybody knows is Getting to Yes. But it's not just about using yes when you're, when you're dealing with communication in the workplace or dealing with situations in the workplace. It's also using yes and using no. Could you talk a little bit about... Um, using yes and using no in discussions and, and negotiations just in everyday, everyday work? For sure, for sure. Uh, well, if you think about it, yes and no are the most fundamental words in any language, and therefore sometimes are the most problematic. And it's almost like we, have, like we have two arms. We have a yes arm and a no arm. And from an early age, we're rewarded heavily for using the yes arm and we're stigmatized for using the no arm because our parents 
do not like to hear the word no. And the age at which we learn to use the word no is around the age of two. And in English, we stigmatize that as the terrible twos. But developmental psychologists will tell us that that's an extremely important age because that's the age at which the child learns to individuate. They learn to become a separate individual. I like this. I don't like that. No is the word of identity. It's the word of power, really. And children, you know, young children love to use it and could drive their, their parents crazy. But, you know, teachers don't like to hear the word no. Bosses don't like to hear the word no. And yet, so what happens is we have a strongly developed yes arm and a weakly developed no arm often. And so uh, what happens is when we do say no, it's very destructive. Or often we don't say no. We have a lot of us have trouble saying no. And to me, the, what we need to do in life, since we need the word no very much, uh, I mean, in this world right now, for example, in order if you want to get anything done, any product, any project, anything that really matters to you, you have to say no to a lot of other things in order to free up the time and energy to devote to that. Uh, so the word no is enormously important. It's, it's the word of focus. It's also the word of how you protect your boundaries and protect your core values is through the word no. And so what I found is that no may be uh, the most powerful word in the language. But because it's the most powerful word in the language, of course, it can be the most destructive word. But if we can learn to use it constructively, in other words, positively, as what I call a positive no, it can literally transform our, our work lives and our personal lives is knowing how to use the word no as a positive no. And I wrote a book about this called The Power of a Positive No. And, and, uh, but essentially, a positive no in a nutshell is like a sandwich. It starts not with a no, but with a yes. And that yes is to what is truly important to you. It's followed by the word no delivered in a respectful manner. And then it doesn't end on the word no, it ends on another yes. So it's a yes, no, yes. And an example would be, let's imagine you're in your workplace and your boss tells you that you've got to work over the weekend and you have an important, like a family wedding or something. So you begin with your yes, you know, you explain to the boss, you know, I have a family wedding this weekend. Uh, you know, that's your yes. So you're not saying no to them. And so... Uh, I'm not going to be able to work this weekend. And then you go to the yes on the other side, which is, and here's the solution. I, I'd be happy to work, you know, overtime some nights, or I can get a couple of other people to work. Here's how we can get the work done and the problem solved. So basically, you start with a yes. You have a very respectful, calm, matter-of-fact no, and you end on a yes. Uh, and it turns out that, you know, a positive no is, is key to being able to both use, unleash the, the potential of no, but do it in a way that doesn't hurt the relationship, in fact, can strengthen the relationship, because people will respect you more if you're able to say no. And, uh, and oftentimes, the people who don't say no are kind of like they're hiding. It's like, it's like a friend who says, you know, they'll go out with you, you know, they'll go out with you next Wednesday night. And because they can't say no, and then, the, 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 you know, a few minutes before, a half hour before, they call you up and say they can't make it. You'd much rather hear the word no, the truth of the word no, early on so you can make alternative plans. So actually saying no to someone else can be a gift. So in terms of, uh, of a good leader, a good leader knows how to use no in the right way? For sure. No, I think leadership is as much about being able to say no as it is about being able to say yes, uh, a good leader. I think that's the hard thing of leadership is really uh, knowing how to do that. I actually remember I had a fellow in one of my classes who was the uh, CEO of an internet company in Seattle. He was a Frenchman. His name was Jacques. And when the internet stock market fell, went bust uh, a number of years ago, Every, you know, internet companies were failing and everyone had to lay off workers and, and he had the very unpleasant job of uh, having to lay off 500 engineers uh, because there was no money to pay them. It was, you know, the, uh, and, uh, 
And most leaders would have delegated that to HR. And HR would have said, okay, now this is a pink slip on someone's table. But what he did was, he, Jacques insisted that how you say the word no as a leader is just as important as any deal you would ever make. So he insisted personally on sitting down with every one of the 500 engineers and having a personal meeting with them where he would explain, you know, the you know, basically the yes was in order to save this company that we've all, you know, this we've all spent this time, you know, working that we really wanted to develop. You know, I would like to be able to retain you, but there's just there's there's uh, there's no money. I can't pay you. So what can I do to help you? You know, can I give you, give you a good letter of reference? Can we help you find you a job somewhere? Can we help you give you a training opportunity? Well, lo and behold, he did that. Uh, the key element, of course, was respect. Uh, he sat down with them and, and was respectful. And he said uh, about a year later, the money came into the stock market and his company was able, everyone was try, trying to rehire uh, engineers and guess who had first pick? Mm -hmm. Was Jacques. Why? Because he had gone to the trouble of respecting people. He said he was still stopped in the streets of Seattle by some engineers whom he wasn't able to rehire, who thanked him for the way that, in which they'd been fired. Uh, because it's that elemental aspect of respect. And so that may be the hardest thing for a leader, is to have to face those kinds of tough decisions. But this is where, again, Respect is the underlying bedrock. Yeah. yeah. Just thinking about somebody who is, you know, going into their job every day um, and maybe dreading it because they're certain things they didn't want to have to deal with, certain people they don't want to have to deal with. What would you say to them? What, what kind of tips would you give them to think about the discussions they're getting ready to have? Um, the compromises they're going to have to make, the conflict that they may have to undergo. What are just some general tips that you would give people to go in and think about communications every day as they would go, as they walk into the door of their workplace? Well, first thing is uh, something I mentioned earlier, which is the ability to go to the balcony, to realize that human beings were reaction machines, were under a lot of stress. And so, and, and as Mary was mentioning, you're getting a lot of texts and emails, and it's very easy to be reactive. And so the most important thing is to develop ways to go to the balcony, to get that, that place of perspective, even if it's like taking a minute to just to, to breathe, or it, it, rather than, you know, as, as the old saying goes, when angry, you will make the best speech you will ever regret. You know, the ability to just pause, hit the pause button, go to the balcony, remember before the day what are your key goals? What is the key prize for you? And uh, keep that in mind throughout because it's going to be very easy to get distracted or reactive. And then the ability to put yourself at, uh, in the shoes of the other. Have, no, now, when you go to the balcony, you understand what your core interests are. But then it's very important to understand what the other sides are. And that's where the, the tool of listening comes in so handy. And then understanding what your interests, what you really want, and understanding what they really want, then I think one of the keys is to be creative in inventing options for a joint gain, looking for ways that work for both sides, and not just you know, standard win-wins, what's good for me and good for you, but what's good for the whole, what's good for the work unit, what's good for the company, what's good for the community. And so it's a kind of a triple win as you're looking for, a win, a win, and a win for the whole. That, that I think is, uh, if you can just keep going for that, and because you're going to hit obstacles, it's going to seem like it's impossible. But what I've often found is don't underestimate the power of creativity, and not just your creativity, but the creativity of the group. If you put it back to the, to the group and say, how do we handle this problem? Uh, you, the, the, the group itself, if you, can, if you can tap their collective intelligence, their collective wisdom, there's a lot there. It doesn't all have to be on your shoulders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as you say, um, empathy is sort of the basis of all, you know, conflict, resolution, problem solving. But can you teach somebody to be empathetic? Well, one thing I just want to say just on that topic, just before we get to the question of teaching, is 
uh, Google, uh, which where the work is done in teams, uh, commissioned a big study to study their teams to figure out which teams were most effective, which teams were most productive, and what made for successful teams. And they did this big study. Uh, and you know, some teams were a little more hierarchical, other teams were not. There were all kinds of differences in the teams. They found the one common element, or actually the two common elements of successful teams were one, communication, uh, which, was, which effectively meant making sure that everyone had a voice, everyone was heard, not just the leader talking all the time, but, but everyone in the group was heard. And the second was empathy, was the ability to read the feelings of others. So to come to your question, Mary, can it be taught? Well, I think empathy is an innate human ability. So it's not, it's not just about being, it's not so much about being taught, it's about being uncovered or discovered. We all have that. I mean, even neuroscience these days has discovered that there, there's a kind of neuron in your brain called a mirror neuron, where, where if someone else is sad, that part of the brain gets turned on and you, you, you feel a little wave of sadness or whatever the, the feeling is. And so it, it's about being able to rediscover our own innate human talent for, for empathy. But how do we do that? Well, how do we do that is a good question. I think, first of all, when we're doing it as adults, uh, we're beginning, we're doing what I, what I consider to be remedial education, mm -hmm. but the, uh, because it's something that, you know, you learn as children and, uh, and then what happens is sometimes our innate capacities for empathy get blocked when we're, when we're young. And so the question is, how do you, how do you remove the blocks? But I think the thing to do there, it, it's there in us. It's just covered up, and so the and so what we can do is you can if you take for example in your communication courses as I know you know there's a lot of exercises where you start to if you can stop talking for a moment and listen and, and let the other person tell their story then you'll start to see ah okay the empathy will naturally arise. There's a saying that old saying that I read that an enemy is someone whose story you haven't heard. Hmm. And uh, so when you, <laughs> when you see someone, it's, a, it's, a, it's basically if you can hear someone, you'll begin to see the empathy develop. And so it's, it's partly a question of allowing time and then practice. All these things require a lot of practice, but, um, but the, you know, just a little, pra you know, it's a little practice every day on something. So someone says, you know, I really want to hone my ability to be empathetic. Well, if you set that your, as your intention and you're reflective about it, you can, you know, pra practice it at home with your, with, with a family member, with your spouse or a child, listen to them and then know where you get blocked, where it's hard for you to listen to them. Um, you know, one of the biggest blocks to empathy that I find, which is at the same time the biggest block to listening, is, is ourselves. Uh, we are not, the reason why it's hard for us to be empathetic with others is we haven't been empathetic with ourselves. And in fact, that's, that's the subject of my latest book, which is called Getting to Yes with Yourself. Uh, because what I've discovered is that the... The biggest block to getting to yes with others is that we haven't gotten to yes with ourselves. And a key part of that is, the, is training our own ability to listen to ourselves. I mean, if you remember that, that story I told you about negotiating with, with President Chavez, I wasn't able to listen to him until I was able to listen to myself, to all those voices that were saying, oh, my, you know, what's happening here? And, and he's wrong and all of that. By listening to myself first from a balcony perspective, I was able to kind of free myself from those voices a little bit, free up a little space so that I could then listen to him. And that's the key. And in terms of practice, it's true. It takes a little bit every day. These are not things that you can just like, okay, learn listening in, in, in a day and that's it. No, these are things we practice every day. They're like muscles that you have to strengthen every single day. But the great advantage that we have is that we have huge numbers of opportunities to practice in every single context with every single person that we meet. Mm -hmm. 
You know, thinking about what you're saying, it almost seems like if, if somebody is making a concerted effort to be more empathetic or to listen better, they're probably already halfway there. <laughs> If they're actually thinking about it and making an effort to do that. That's it. That's it, Brent. If you set the intention, you'd be surprised. Uh, and then, you know, just like, you know, every morning, you know, you set the intention of, okay, what's going to be the intention for this day? What do I want to learn today? And then at the end of the day, you know, taking a minute to just to review, what did I learn today? What worked? What didn't work? What am I going to try differently tomorrow morning? That simple habit of taking a minute in the morning and a minute in the evening can make all the difference. So here now is a very special conversation between Bill Urey and Barry Waymuller's Bob Chapman. So, um, yeah, we were just remembering uh, Simon a, calling me up yeah. uh, after he just visited your plants there in, in Phillips, Wisconsin. And, yeah. uh and telling me he's seen the future, <laughs> and and I was and I was saying, you know, it's it's, I, I go to all these peace talks, but what's key, more important than talking, is listening. And what we need is peace listening. <laughs> yeah, right. And so you know the, the the and the microcosm, what you've got going there, is exactly what we need in the macrocosm, which is people learning to listen with empathy. And I understand that's that's a, that's the theme that's of the your mission. book. That's that's the, the mission. Yeah, I, I would say to you that what I've learned is people say, can you boil it down into a simple statement? What do you want me to go away with? And I said, simply care about people and then you actualize caring through listening. You can't be a leader. You can't be a leader. You can be a manager, a boss, a supervisor, but you can't be a leader unless you know how to listen because you can't understand the needs of your people. And I think when Simon wrote his book, uh, leaders eat last. He talked about how in the military, officers profoundly care for the, for the men and women under their command. And wouldn't it be amazing in business if leaders saw their responsibility to the people under their command? And, uh, and we, we think it's wonderful in the military, but we, we don't consider it important in business. Yeah, and so I would, you know, in, in business we give bonuses to people who sacrifice others in service of themselves. Some company lays off 5,000 people, their costs are going to go down, their share price goes up. Right. Good job. And so I honestly believe, Bill, in, in terms of the world you live in, which is the world of conflict, the, the thing that we got out of this book is that, and we've seen it in the military, education, yeah. and healthcare, and business, that because we haven't created leaders, leaders who care for, yeah. and care is not being nice any more than parenting is being nice, is truly care for the people under their command, under their stewardship, uh, that we send people home yeah. frustrated, not feeling valued. It affects their marriage, it affects the way they raise their children, and they don't, if people don't feel valued, we, we create kind of this conflict in our communities, in our country, why do you think our Democrats and Republicans in the Congress can't uh, understand each other? Is because they, they don't know. How, you know, we, we hear a lot of talking, but we don't hear a lot of listening. So I think that was the biggest thing we got out of the book. And so let me tell you, I mean, there's a lot of truth, and I mean, I resonate deeply with what you're saying. So where, where does it come from in your own life? Why did you? What what impelled you to to, to go on this path and ultimately write this book about everybody matters? Well. We originally simply, um, I always describe it as at one stage I was trying to raise a family of six, Cynthia and I were, and uh, it's quite a challenge to, because we're not taught to be parents, so you have to learn to be parents. And over here I was taking my, my education, my undergraduate and graduate education to try and run a good business. And what I found in the 80s and 90s is that everything I learned about parenting was about leadership. And everything I learned in business school was about management. And management is all about me and my success. I was never taught to care for the people who I would use in my journey to success. And so these revelations occurred. Right. You know, uh, why can't business be fun? The power of business because we have people's lives in our hands for 40 hours a week. And finally, that everybody that works for us is somebody's precious child. Because I was taught that people are accountants, they're salesmen, they're receptionists, they're engineers, they're professors, they're doctors. They're not people, they're functions. And when you see them as functions, as long as you need them, you might be nice to them. 
But when you don't need them anymore, it's, it's nothing personal. Right. It's just, right. we don't need them. So I would say to you, these revelations that occurred when I started realizing the power of parenting is true leadership. It is, what is parenting? The stewardship of the lives entrusted to you through birth, adoption, second marriages. What is leadership? The stewardship of the lives entrusted to you by the people who join your organization, who, who, who you have a profound chance to change. And these revelations keep came in, coming, and then we met people like Simon and you who came in and said, and many others, I've never seen anything like this. And we, we, we didn't intend, we didn't know that we had something unique. We were just responding to these revelations and it became a calling. It came internally, but it was really Simon and you in the first stages that came in and said, there's something special here. And it was finally Srikumar Rao who said, Bob, I've interviewed thousands of CEOs and I've never seen anything like this. You've got to share this with the world. That's what caused us to write the book because we feel uh, too much is given, much is expected. We believe we were given a gift. It's not ours to own, it's ours to share. And I've had the incredible opportunity of you taking me around and being able to talk to you know, dozens if not hundreds of conversations with the employees on the, on the shop floor and whatever, and see, because I wanted to see, is, is this real? for real? Yeah, right. So, is it possible to Is care? it possible? <laughs> and, and, you know, does it really work? Yeah. So, so you want to tell us a little bit about how, how it really works, both in the soft sense, but also in the hard sense, a, a, a business where, you know, you well, gotta, you got to uh, make things work. Well, you know, let's see, if, if we had a machine tool in our company and we paid, uh, $500,000 for the machine tool, we could look at the plant and say it needs to run. And we know, we can tell whether it's running efficiently or not by measuring it. But then we look at our people and three out of four people are disengaged. Seven out of eight people feel they work for a company that care about them. We know people are basically not sharing their gifts with us. And, but that's, that's not what compelled us, okay? What compelled us was the, the revelation sure. that, 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 that by caring, it started with a simple thought. What if we could send people home fulfilled? Not happy, fulfilled. A sense that who they are and what they do matters. That, it, 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 and that's, it, it stopped right there. I mean, we just said, if, what if we could do that? <laughs> and then some people started saying to us, as a result of what you've now done, I have a better marriage, I have, I'm raising my kids better, I'm a happier person, I enjoy. And what we found, and you know, St. Louis University and Washington already found this, uh, uh, Washington University and Georgetown, that when I started caring about you, all of a sudden you started caring about right. five contagious. other people. It's contagious. And what Simon says, which I think is great, because it never occurred to us that if I cared about you, you'd start caring about other people. Right. And, and what the professors found in their survey is a high degree of altruism. Right. People doing things for others without expecting anything in return. Isn't that the world that you want to live in? People doing things for others without expecting anything in return. And we didn't ask them to do that. We simply cared about you and you cared about them. Right. And uh, George Flynn, who works with Simon, said something that was interesting because he came into our New Mexico operation. He said, you know, I talked to 30, 40 people, he said, and what was interesting to me is they described it as a family. He said they didn't describe it like a family. They described it as a family. And I said, isn't that interesting? Because they're not related to each other. You know, these are sure. not brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers. They used a word that came to them as right. a place where they feel safe and cared for. That's what family is, right? Where you right. feel safe and cared for, the ultimate caring. And that's the word they used. They said, it's a family. And so we started seeing, and we really, we didn't know what we had until people like you came in and said, wow, there's something special here. And Simon said, I'm no longer a nutty idealist. I've seen what I believed right. in. You know, and and if, it's, if it exists, it must be possible. Right, So that's it. So we felt we had to share it because how can you not share a gift? It's not ours, we don't own this. Somebody just chose us. And, and Simon, you know, Amy Cuddy said, uh, I loved what she said. She said, I thought places like this only existed in my head. Right. This is as close to utopia as I've ever seen. And Simon said, all you're really seeing is people live the way we are naturally called to live with each other. Yeah. Which is, you know, uh, with, with caring, you know, that's validating it. the it. worth of each other. And you can't do that unless you listen to each other. And that's, that's absolutely. So if there's like a, a 
takeaway, a practical takeaway, you know, for people to really put this into practice, what, what, what would you want uh, people who read your book to, to take away and, and reflect on and, and implement? Well, I think, I think a compelling message is that the way we lead, lead in our businesses, in our hospitals, affects the way people live. Never have I heard, I always thought business was business and family was family. Yeah. But what we found, without a question, is that the way we lead in organizations affects the way pe people's marriages and therefore the way they raise their children. So I'd want everybody to be aware that it's not just at work. You know, the way we treat people will affect their life, not just the way they work, but at home. The second thing I'd say is, and the simple, and they say, well, Boil it down to something really simple. I said, simply care. Okay, simply care. And care, like parenting, is, is not being nice. Caring is a profoundly responsible, you know, when, you, when you're a parent, it's sure. not being nice. Caring is a profoundly a stronger, uh, uh, and the way you care, you, and you can't care unless you can listen to your people and be good stewards. So my hope is that we redefine leadership. We, 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 we lose the words management, bosses, and supervisors, the brokenness of, of language, and we end up with uh, leaders, mentors, and coaches, people who profoundly accept the responsibility and are prepared for that responsibility. So we not only try to awaken them into the responsibility in the first part of the book, but then we show them how to care, yeah. how to actualize caring, so that people can go home knowing that who they are and what they do matters. And if we do that, there's a better chance they're gonna be able to have a more fulfilling personal life and be a better caring person themselves for the people they are serving. Don't forget to find us and connect on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, at Barry Waymiller. And you can find more podcasts, articles, and videos at trulyhumanleadership.com. I'm Brent Stewart. Thanks for listening.